good evening everyone from india i am someone from world it might be okay it might be good morning uh, here at the second webinar series on silo automata which we which we started in two months back with the talk of professor enrico fermenti so today's talk is tiles appendicity and domino problem in ca theory our speaker is professor jarko kari professor kari needs no introduction specifically he is uh, a pioneer a famous scientist in our field but still for the sake of our program i'll briefly introduce him Professor Kari is currently a professor at the Department of Mathematics, University of Turku, and a leading personality in the domain of theoretical computer science, especially for his contributions to the theory of warm tiles and cello automata. He received his PhD in 1990 from the University of Turku. In a remarkable work, he has proved that the reversibility of two-dimensional cello automata is an undecidable problem. He is one of the pioneers in developing security systems using reversible CA. His research interest also includes computation theory, automatic theory, and image compression. Besides serving as chair, committee member, and editor of some premier conferences and journals, and delivering uh, invited lectures and tutorials all over the globe, in the domain of computer science, he is also like he is also very nice and humble as a person, and that proves whenever you interact with him. And uh, he has been in touch with our group for, for a very long time. He has already given us a series of lectures. He has participated in our workshop, and he finally has agreed to find time to give lecture in this webinar series. So thank you so much, sir, for coming to this series. Now over to you. Thank you, Kamalka. Thank you very much for such a nice, nice uh, introduction. And also I would like to thank both Kamalika and Sukanta for organizing this uh, nice uh, webinar series on cellular automata and to give, for giving me this opportunity to, to talk about uh, tilings and cellular automata here. Um, so let me see if I can share my slides here. See? I hope you see my slides now. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, so everything I will be talking here about is pretty old uh, material. So the results are basically from uh, last century, last millennium, to, to tell the truth. But when we discussed with Sukanta about this talk, we agreed that this might be a nice topic because I understand that in the audience there are people who may be, may be new to this field or uh, maybe have not heard about uh, this uh, relationship of bank tiles to cellular automata. But so I apologize for anyone who already know this stuff very well. So um, as you all know, cellular automata are uh, dynamical systems where you have a local update rule that tells how you update the states. And Wang tiles, I will, I will briefly, in, in a moment, I will define them precisely. But Wang tiles are very similar objects. So they are static arrangements, not dynamical system, but static arrangements of tiles where you have a local rule that tells which tiles are allowed to be next to each other. So these are very similar objects. And so it is not that surprising that the theories of tilings and theory of cellular automata have a lot in common with each other. Now for Wang tilings, one of the 
most, uh, I mean, the most classical result is a famous theorem by Berger from 1964 that the domino problem, which I also will define in a moment, is undecidable, cannot be solved by any algorithm. And the main point of my talk is to show how this Berger result can be used to prove several questions about cellular automata to be also undecidable. Well, before I start, let me very briefly give you some very basic notations that I use, just to make sure that we are on the same page. So all my cellular automata and tilings will be on, on infinite grid. So cells are elements of a d-dimensional grid. And most of the time, or pretty much all the time, it will be two-dimensional grid. And now a configuration is just a coloring of the grid by symbols from some finite uh, set A. And if I talk about cellular automata, the elements of A are states, are called states. And if I talk about tilings, they are tiles. Okay, and the set of all d-dimensional configurations over some uh, finite set A is uh, denoted as usual like that. So they are all functions from C to D to A. All right, so let me go to bank tiles. So a bank tile is a very simple kind of tile. It's a, just a unit square tile. There's no geometric uh, complications here at all. And it has a colored edge. Let me show you an example. So here you have an example of four wang tiles. And you see they have colored edges. And you are now tiling the infinite two-dimensional grid by putting these tiles, copies of these four tiles on the grid. And the rule is that two tiles are allowed to be put next to each other if the color on the adjacent edge is the same. So the colors give the matching rule. So for example, with these four tiles here, A, B, C, D, I can, for example, the tile like this. So this is a, just a finite portion of an infinite tiling. And you see how I have used the tiles in my tile set and everywhere the neighboring tiles have the same color on the adjacent edge. So this is a correct, correctly tiled five by five square. Uh, and the tiles are not rotated or anything. They are, they have to be placed in the orientation that they are given in the, in the set. And now if you look at this five by five square tiling that I have here, and you look at the colors on the top and the bottom of the square. So you have red, red, green, green, yellow, and red, red, green, green, yellow. So the same sequence of colors on top and the bottom. And the same way on the left side and the right side, you have the same sequence of colors. So it means that I can take this five by five pattern and repeat it periodically in the horizontal direction and also in the vertical direction to actually tile the whole infinite plane in a periodic manner. So that would be an example of a periodic tiling. Just five, five by five period that repeats to infinity in all directions like here. Here is a sample of that uh, kind of part of that periodic tiling. And so periodicity of tilings plays an important role. So that's why I wanted to show you an example of a periodic tiling. Okay, so you, for me, a periodic tiling is, is, a, is, is a tiling where you have a, some period repeating both horizontally and vertically throughout the whole grid. All right, so then let's talk about the domino problem. So this is an algorithmic question where you are given as an input a set of Wang tiles, a finite collection of tiles. And you are asked to decide whether it's possible to tile the infinite plane with these tiles or not. Because of course, with some sets of tiles, it's impossible to tile the whole infinite plane but with some sets of tiles, it is possible. So this is an algorithmic question. You want to design an algorithm 
that tells you for any given bank tile set, it should tell you whether it's possible to tile the infinite grid, infinite plane, or not. All right. And so it's not obvious how to write such an algorithm, how to write a computer program that would settle this question. And in fact, the really classical result by Berger from 64 states that you cannot write such an algorithm. There is, it does not exist. It's this domino problem is an example of an undecidable problem. It's not possible to make a computer program that would give the correct answer for every set, bank tile set that you give it as an input. Any algorithm candidate will necessarily fail on some sets. So let me point out some observations about this theorem. So first of all, let me note that if, if a set of bank tiles can tile arbitrarily big but finite squares, then it also can tile the whole plane. So if you can tile 10 by 10 squares, 100 by 100 squares, 1000 by 1000 squares, and so on, in a kind of, it's, it's kind of uh, intuitive that in the limit, you actually can obtain a valid tiling of the whole infinite plane. Okay, and it's a kind of, if you want to prove it precisely, it's a kind of a compactness argument that this limit can be taken. And what this means is that there is a so-called semi-algorithm to recognize tile sets that do not tile the plane, that are kind of negative instances to the domino problem. And it follows from one, and here is a semi, I, I, it also ho hopefully explains what is a semi-algorithm to those of you who, who, who don't know this concept. So we have a process that will be able to recognize the negative instances to the, to the domino problem as follows. So you just make, a, make, make an algorithm or, or a semi process that tries to tile bigger and bigger squares. Okay, so you try, you first try all possible ways of tiling a 10 by 10 square, let's say, and then you try to tile 100, and 100, by, 100 by 100 square, and so on. And you keep on doing that. And if at some moment you find a number n such that it's not possible to tile n by n square with your tiles, then you know that your tile set does not tile the infinite plane, because it does not even tile the finite part of it. You see, and then you can give the answer that no, this tile set does not tile the plane. But this is not an algorithm for the domino problem. This is just a semi algorithm because on positive instances, so if your tile set does properly tile the plane, you will never get the yes answer. So if you give to this uh, my semi algorithm as an input uh, positive instance, the tile set that tiles the plane, this process just keeps on going forever. You are just tiling bigger and bigger squares and you always succeed to tile the plane. You never get the answer that you can actually tile the whole infinite plane. You see, this is what, what a semi-algorithm means. It, it, it answers correctly, uh, let's say the negative instances, but on positive instances, it runs forever. It's not a proper algorithm. Now, in the same way, we can see that there is a semi-algorithm to recognize those tile sets that tile periodically, that admit a periodic tiling of the plane. And just the same way, just try to try all possible ways of tiling bigger and bigger rectangles until you find a rectangular tiling where the top colors and bottom colors are the same and the left and right edges boundaries also have the same colors. Exactly as in our previous example where we had the five by five square tiled in this manner. Because then you know when you find such a rectangle, then you know that, okay, there is a periodic tiling because then you just repeat this uh, 
for example, to fill in the whole plane periodically, exactly as we did with the 5 by 5 example. Right? But now if, uh, we will, if, if, if the tile set does not admit a periodic tiling again, we will never get an answer because you just try to find uh, these rectangular patterns that are bigger and bigger and bigger. That would be uh, the period and you will never find one. So on negative instances, you just keep on going forever. All right, so we have two semi-algorithms, one to recognize tile sets that do not admit any tilings and one that recognizes those tile sets that admit periodic tilings. So now what you can do is that you run these two semi-algorithms in parallel on your input. Okay, and if the first semi-algorithm gives an answer, then you know that there is no tiling. If the second algorithm algorithm begins with an R square, you know that there is a periodic tiling. But because there is no algorithm, this algorithm cannot this cannot be an algorithm. So there must be some instances such that neither of these semi-algorithm holds. And these are called aperiodic tile sets. So they are tile sets that admit a valid tiling so that the first same algorithm does not give an answer. But they do not admit any periodic tiling so that the second same algorithm doesn't give an answer. So they must exist, such style sets. They are kind of fall in the crack between these two semi-algorithms. You never get an answer on either one of them if you have such an aperiodic tile set given as an input. You see? So these are tile sets that only tile the plane in a non-periodic way. They kind of force the non-periodicity in the tiling, and they exist. And in fact, uh, yeah, I just explained that already. In fact, the first aperiodic tile set was constructed by Berger as part of this undecidability proof of the domino problem. So actually, historically, it was the other way around. So the, he he needed first to construct the aperiodic tile set, and then that, you, that was used as part of this undecidability proof of the domino problem. Now, the aperiodic Wang tile set of Berger was huge. I mean, it had like uh, 65,000 tiles. And uh, then over the years, smaller and smaller aperiodic sets were dis discovered. And the smallest one, which has 11 tiles, was just found quite recently by Emmanuel Jandel and Michel Rao uh, in 2015. So here are these 11 tiles. So this is an aperiodic tile set. These, these five, 11 tiles, you can tile the plane, but only in non-periodic ways. And in fact, they show that this is the smallest aperiodic Wang tile set. So there is no smaller one. Uh, they kind of exhaustively search all the smaller tile sets and there is no 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 smaller aperiodic tile set. Okay, so the domino problem can be reduced to many questions concerning cellular automata, two-dimensional cellular automata, so that we see that these questions, algorithmic questions about cellular automata are undecidable. And I will show here several examples of this and like I pointed out in the beginning, it's not very surprising that there is a connection because the Wang tiles are just very similar to cellular automata. They are kind of static versions of dynamical cellular automata. So in this webinar series, I don't think I need to define cellular automaton precisely. So you all know that a cellular automaton is a, is a transformation of the configuration space. So as I point, as I said before, my configurations are infinite. So I have an infinite grid, and the elements, the colors that I put on the grid elements are called the states of the CA. And the next configuration is obtained from the previous configuration by updating simultaneously the states of cells using a local update rule. So the local update rule that tells you based on 
the pattern around the cell, it tells you the new state of that cell. And micellar automata are uniform, meaning that the local update rule is the same in every cell. All right, so let me start by showing you how we can convert a bank tile set into a two-dimensional cellular automaton. So let's say T is an arbitrary bank tile set. And I will make a cellular automaton whose states are these tiles. So the states of the cellular automaton are bank tiles. And my local rule is the following. So in every cell, like here, I look at the four immediate neighbors. This is called the von Neumann neighborhood in CA theory. I look at the four immediate neighbors. And if they match with me in color, like here, so all the four neighbors have matching colors, then I don't change my tile. So here, this tile A remains the same. But if there is a tiling error with any tile, let's say here between, I have a tiling error with my uh, lower neighbor, then I will change this tile somehow. I don't know, maybe I just go to the next tile in my set. So now A changes into B. So, so this is my local rule. You don't change the tile if the tiling is correct. Okay, so now it's kind of obvious that a configuration is a fixed point of the cellular automaton if and only if it's a valid tiling as a tile. As, as a tiling. Because in order for the configuration to be fixed points, you cannot have such a situation where you have a, a, a tiling error. It's a fixed point if and only if everywhere happens this, like up, up here. So fixed points are exactly the valid tilings, which means that you cannot have any algorithm to tell if a given two-dimensional cellular automaton has any fixed points. This must be an undecidable problem. The problem to, to decide if a given cellular automaton has fixed points. Because if you would have an algorithm to decide if a given CA has any fixed points, then you could use that algorithm to solve the domino problem, which is not possible by Berger's theorem. You could solve the domino problem because for any given tile set, you first build that cellular automaton that I showed you on the previous slide, and then you check if it has any fixed points. And we know that it has fixed points if and only if the tiles have a valid tiling. You see? So in this way, we have reduced solving the domino problem to the problem of solving the fixed point problem of cellular automaton and therefore the latter has to be undecidable because the former is undecidable. This was a very simple type of reduction and all I, I will be showing several other reductions in this talk so let me just these are called many one reductions. So I sh showed how any instance of a decision problem x, in this case x is the domino problem, can be converted into an equivalent instance of a second decision problem y. And in this, in this case, in, in my case here, this problem y was the fixed point problem of cellular automata. And I showed how any tile set can be converted into a cellular automata that has fixed points if and only if the tile set admits a tile. And so if you can do that, then you know that any algorithm that solves y can be used to solve x. It's a reduction. And so contrapositively, it means that if x is undecidable, then y has to be undecidable also. It cannot have an algorithm because it would give an algorithm for x. So this is a many one reduction, just to remind you of this concept. This is how we prove new problems to be undecidable when we have some other problems known to be undecidable.
So let me show another maybe more interesting reduction, which is to prove that uh, it's undecidable to tell if a two-dimensional cellular automaton is nilpotent. Okay, and so what is a nilpotent CA? A CA is nilpotent if its dynamics is very trivial in the sense that every configuration uh, eventually goes into some fixed point and all the configurations go to the same fixed point of the cellular automaton. So the dynamics is very trivial because it doesn't matter what you have in the beginning, eventually you are uh, you evolve into into some the same uh, uniform configuration in the end because it's a unique fixed point it has to be a, a uniform configuration and we call it a quiescent configuration and now you may want to know for any given cellular automaton is it nilpotent or not is it this does it have only this trivial dynamics and Julik, Buckle, and you showed that this is an undecidable problem. And the proof is a, a reduction from the domino problem. So the reduction goes like that. So we want to construct for any given Wang tile set a cellular automaton that is nilpotent if and only if your tile set does not admit a tiling. That's all we need to do. Show how we can effectively construct a cellular automaton whose nil potency is a kind of equivalent to the tiling by the tiles. So this is how we do the construction of the cellular automaton. So let's say T is any Wang tile set you are given. And now the tiles will again be our states in the automaton. But we also add a new state, let's say, call it Q. So Q is not among the tiles. Okay, so we have a tiles and plus one more state in our state set. And the local rule goes as follows. Uh, so you, 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 you don't change your state if you are a, if, if you are a tile if your if the state is a tile and all the neighbors immediate neighbors are also tiles and if they all match with you then you don't change the state exactly as in the previous uh, example the fixed point example okay. okay so if everything in your neighborhood is a tile and they match then you don't change the state in all other cases you go to state q so like here if you have a tiling error your new state is q or if there's a q in your anywhere in your neighborhood then your new state is also q so state q spreads in the neighborhood okay to all the to to to, to the neighbors I hope the local rule is clear. Of course, now uh, we have one fixed point always, namely the uniform configuration where every cell is in state Q because Q does not change. So that will be a fixed point configuration. And this is the quiescent configuration of this CA. Now, if your tile set admits a valid tiling, then that valid tiling is also a fixed point. Because in the valid tiling, no, no cell changes the tile. So now it means that in this case, we have two different fixed points. So this cellular automaton is not nilpotent. Right? So if the tile set admits a tiling, then the CA we constructed is not a nilpotent CA. What about conversely? If your tile set does not admit a tiling, then we know that 
it cannot tile n pi n square for some big number n. I told you before that if you can tile arbitrarily big finite squares, then you also can tile the whole plane. Well, because it doesn't tile the whole plane, for some n, it does not properly tile n pi n squares. So it means that every n pi n square will either contain q or contain a tiling error. So when you apply the CA, you will have state q appearing in every n pi n square. And because state q spreads, it propagates to all the neighbors, you know that in uh, at most two n more steps, everything will be covered by state q. So if tiles at t does not tile the plane, then your CA is nil potent. So this is a many one reduction. We reduce the tiles at t into a cellular automaton and the nil potency is uh, kind of obtained from the tileability property of the tiles at t. So nil potency has to be undecidable. Otherwise we could use this to solve the domino problem. I hope this reduction was clear. Uh, maybe interesting to note that if you do this construction starting with an aperiodic tile set, T, some, for example, this 11 tile set of Chandel and Rao, you get a two dimensional cellular automaton which has the following uh, non trivial behavior that if you start your cellular automaton with any periodic any periodic initial configuration, uh, then you become eventually quiescent. Because in every periodic configuration, you will have a tiling errors or state Q. And on the other hand, you have non-periodic fixed points. So without aperiodic tile sets, you cannot make uh, such a construction. Okay. Um, so it's, as you have seen in the two previous examples, uh, tilings are very naturally related to two-dimensional cellular automata. But in fact, we can also use tilings to, uh, to uh, prove some questions about one-dimensional cellular automata to be undecidable. We just have to strengthen this Berger's result a little bit. And the basic idea here is to view the space-time diagrams of one-dimensional cellular automata as if they would be two-dimensional tilings. So the space-time diagram, you probably well, you surely know this, the space-time diagram of a cellular automaton is just a drawing where you draw consecutive configurations one after the other. So you, from a one-dimensional CA, you get a two-dimensional uh, picture that represents an orbit of the cellular automaton. And we can view that as a tiling, two-dimensional tiling. Now, uh, this naturally leads to the following uh, definition. We say that a Wang tile set is a northwest deterministic if the color on the north and on the west side of the tile uniquely identifies that tile. So you don't have two tiles in your tile set that would have identical colors on the left and, and on the top. So for example, the four tile sets, four tiles that we had, they are a Northwest deterministic tile set because here you have red, red in tile A, yellow, yellow, green, yellow, and red, green. So each of the four tiles has different combination of colors on the top and on the left. So it's a northwest deterministic tile set. And in this case, you know that in a valid tiling, if you know your northern neighbor and you know your uh, western neighbor, then the tile is uniquely identified by these two neighbors because of this property. And so now if you take a valid tiling, you can look at this kind of diagonal of the tiling and you can view that as like a, a, a 
one-dimensional configuration of a cellular automaton. And now the determinism property of the tile set tells you that each of the tiles below this diagonal are again uniquely determined. So there's only one possibility for the tiles below because of the north based determinism of the tile set. And so there's a kind of a local rule that gives you these tiles. You just have to look at the tile on the left and on above to get this tile. So it's like a cellular automaton. And then you can apply it again to get the next diagonal and so on. And you are drawing a space-time diagram of the cellular automaton. It goes like a diagonally space-time diagram in this case. You see? Valid tilings then represent space-time diagrams. All right, so we do this. Uh, now I want to basically prove that the nil potency is undecidable uh, for one-dimensional cellular automata also. So I will do the reduction from north-west deterministic tile sets into a one-dimensional cellular automaton. So let's say T is a north-west deterministic tile set. And I will build a cellular automaton where, again, as in all the reductions I have shown, tiles are states. And I also add one extra new state, which I call Q. And uh, let me show you the local rule. So the local rule uh, gives you the new state of a cell based on the old state of the cell and the old state of its right neighbor. So I'm looking at the cell and my right neighbor. And the local rule is defined using the tiling property. So if I have a matching tile here, so A and B are two tiles, then if I have a matching tile C here for this A and B, then the local rule gives me C. So if A is the current state of a cell, B is the current state of the right neighbor, then the new state of the cell will be this tile C if there is a matching tile C. And notice that because of the determinism, if there is a matching tile C, it's a unique one. There's only one possible matching tile C. And in all the other cases, my the local rule gives me state Q. So either if uh, A and B, one of them is Q, then C will be Q. Or if there is no matching tile C, then also I go to state Q. So this is my one-dimensional cellular automaton that I construct. And now I claim that this CA is nilpotent if and only if the tile set does not admit a tiling. And it goes quite the same as the pre in the previous reduction. So if my tile set admits a tiling C, then I know that the diagonals of that tiling are configurations that never go into the quiescent configuration because you always have a Next the, the local rule gives you the next diagonal and then next diagonal and the next diagonal. The space-time diagram is this uh, valid tiling. So you are not even going to go to state Q. And so you are not quiescent. I, I mean, you are not uh, nilpotent. Of course, the configuration where every cell is in state Q is a fixed point. And if you are, if you would be nilpotent, every configuration should eventually go to that quiescent configuration. But if there's a valid tiling, then they don't. So it's not nilpotent. And conversely, if your tile set does not admit a valid tiling, then you know that in 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 a, every n pi n square you have a tiling error. Again for some big, big number n. And so you know that in the space-time diagrams, there will be a tiling error. So the state Q will be created inside each segment of length n. And because Q starts spreading, it will, in n more steps, it will cover every cell. And again, 
every configuration therefore will eventually become the quiescent configuration where everything is in state Q. And so we have managed to do the proper reduction from the domino problem to the nil potency problem. Except that, of course, the input tile set was not an arbitrary tile set, but it was a northwest deterministic tile set. But there's a strengthening of Berger's theorem, namely, the domino problem is undecidable even among northwest deterministic tile sets. So this is a stronger statement because now we are restricting the allowed uh, input instances to the domino problem only to tile sets that are uh, deterministic. All right? And so we have proved that nil potency is undecidable. Let me point out that this was actually, I found this out only later, this was actually already proved by a different uh, manner by Andrea and Lewis in 1974. Uh, but I think it's quite natural to uh, this, this proof using uh, using bank tiles also. And again, you see that there must exist aperiodic northwest deterministic tile sets. And if you do the previous construction using an aperiodic northwest deterministic tile set, you again get a, an example of a one dimensional cellular automaton that has some uh, uh, strange behavior. If you start it with any periodic configuration, it eventually becomes uh, quiescent always. But then you have some non-periodic initial configurations where you never create this quiescent state Q because, because it's a part of the, it's a diagonal of a valid tiling. Okay. Then as a kind of a final reduction, I wanted to talk about reversible CAs and I want to show that reversibility is also undecidable. So, for a cellular automaton, we say that this automaton is uh, injective if this function is one to one. So if you don't have two different configurations that would be mapped to the same configuration. And it's surjective if every configuration has at least one preimage. And of course, it's a bijective if it is both one to one and on two so that it has an inverse function also. You can, there's a function backward in time. And the bijective automaton is called reversible if the inverse direction is actually also a cellular automaton. So you have another cellular automaton that goes backwards in time. And there are some very classical results in CA theory, which tell that a cellular automaton, if it's injective, then it is automatically also bijective. So surjectivity is implied by injectivity. You can, do, you, you can prove this either using so-called Cardinal of Eden theorem, or you can go through periodic configurations to, to, to prove this, this equivalence. And there is an other classical result which says that your cellular automaton, if it is bijective, it is reversible. So if it is bijective, there is an inverse function, which one might think that maybe it's not a cellular automaton at all, but in fact, it is automatically always cellular automaton. This is a kind of compactness argument. Hedlund's theorem gives that. All right, so injectivity is the same thing as reversibility. Uh, reversible cellular automata are very important because uh, in, uh, when you build cellular automata models for microscopic physics, they should be reversible as physics is also reversible. Let me show, maybe I have time to show you an example of a, of a reversible model in physics, the cellular automaton model, so-called Q2R, Ising model, uh, where you have, basically you have two states. It's a two-dimensional cellular automaton and you basically have uh, two possible states which I will denote by arrow pointing up or down. It's like a spin which is either up or down. And uh, local rule uh, basically, 
I will, I will modify it a little bit in a moment. But basically, the local rule is as follows. In a cell, you check the four immediate neighbors. And if you, are, if you see equally many spins up and down, then you flip your spin. So like here, I have in my among my neighbors, I have two spins down and two spins up. Therefore, I flip this spin. Otherwise, you don't flip if you have a different number of directions in your neighborhood. But if you use this local rule on all the cells of the grid, you are not going to, you are not getting an injective map. You are not getting a reversible CA. But we can do a little twist here or trick, which is that we don't update all the cells of the grid, but we only update half of them at each time step. So we color the grid like an infinite checkerboard. And on even time steps, you only update, let's say, the, 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 the white cells of the grid of the checkerboard. And on odd time steps, you update the black cells of the grid. So like here, the white cells are active and they are updated using the rule that I gave you on the previous slide. And for the next time step, I change the active ones to be the black ones, and then they are updated. And then I alternate white, black, white, black. And now it's clear that I get a, get, get a reversible CA because you see here, when I'm updating the spins, the four neighbors are not updated. So it's easy to go back in time because now I know in this cell, I know whether it was flipped or not. So if I do the same flip again, I just go back one step back in time. So basically the same rule takes you back in time if you just don't uh, switch from white cells to black cells. You skip the switching and then the same local rule starts to trace you back in time, in fact. So it's reversible. You have an inverse rule, right? So the same rule reconstructs the previous uh, generation. Maybe I can, I don't know how this works. So this is an experiment, but let me see if I can uh, maybe um, show you a simulation of this. Um, do, 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 do. I switch to another window. Okay, I wonder if you are seeing a cellular automaton configuration, which is just a random noise. I hope so. So uh, basically, let's say that I start this Q2R cellular automaton from an initial configuration where I have just randomly put their spins up and down. Let's say yellow is spin up, red is spin down, for example. And my initial configuration is really uniformly random. So I just flip the fair coin in every cell to get the initial state. And now if I start the Q2R cellular automaton, let's see what happens. I don't know how this works over the internet, but what you should be seeing is just, just white noise, basically. All the configurations that you get are just totally random. And this is a property of every reversible cellular automaton. The uniform randomness is uh, invariant, so under, the, under all reversible cellular automaton. So nothing interesting will ever emerge from uniform randomness under a reversible cellular automaton or surjective cellular automaton, actually, even, even, even more. But now, um, let's see. Okay, so let's say I start with an initial configuration, which is again a random, and I again I flip the coin in every cell. But now my coin was biased, you see? 
So I got many more yellow cells than red cells in my initial configuration. But still, all the cells have an, were, are, are given the state independently of the neighbors. So it's, it's so-called Bernoulli distribution. It's an independently, I flipped a coin in every cell, a biased coin in this case. Now, this kind of randomness, this random distribution is not invariant under Q2R, for example. So when I start to simulate, you see that clearly something is happening. It's not anymore uh, qualitatively the same configuration. Maybe I can zoom out. You see that there's a clustering. The red areas are kind of clustered. And if I stop here, it's clear that this is not uh, any more uh, uh, Bernoulli distribution. So the neighbors, the states in, in neighbors are not independent of each other, but there is a kind of a clear correlation because of this uh, red clusters that you see being created everywhere. Okay, so here something does emerge out of randomness, but it was not a uniform randomness. I hope the simulation was visible. I, I, so let me go to back to my slides. Okay. So that was an example of a, a, a two-dimensional reversible cellular automaton. And so now the reversibility question is the following decision problem. You are given as an input a local rule of a cellular automaton. And the algorithm should tell, is it reversible, this cellular automaton, or not? And I claim that there is no algorithm to solve this problem. Uh, we do have a semi-algorithm, though, because for positive instances, because you can try all candidate inverse automata one by one. So you just enumerate all cellular automata one by one. And for each one you test, is it the inverse function? That can be tested effectively. But if your cellular automaton is not reversible, you will never find it out because you will just keep on trying new and new candidate inverse functions. Okay, so it's semi-decidable, but it is undecidable. There's no algorithm. And uh, I'm kind of in a hurry here, so I will, I will speed up a little bit. In the reduction, to prove that reversibility of two-dimensional cellular automata is undecidable, I will use one particular Wang type set that has some uh, funny property. And I will call this a snakes tile set. Okay, and I will tell you what is this property of the snakes tiles. So first of all, the snakes tiles, they are Wang tiles, but there's also an arrow printed on the tile. So the arrow points to one of the four neighbors. So here is a set of five tiles with an arrow printed on each tile. So I call this directed tiles. There's a direction. See? And now if you take any configuration of tiles on the plane, so you put the, put the tiles arbitrarily on the plane, I'm, I'm not even asking it to be a valid tiling. Now you can start following from any tile you can start following the arrows you always go to the move to the neighbor where the arrow points so for example here let's say i start from the left lower left corner arrow points up i move here then i go right then i go down i go right right up up right right down left left and then i come back to a, it's possible that i come back to a tile where i have been before and then of course this path enters a loop or possibly like here, you never go back to a tile where you have been before, and then you have a kind of infinite path following the arrows that snakes through uh, kind of this tiling that you have. Okay. And now I have constructed this uh, a tile set, this snakes tile set, which has the following interesting property. So. If you take any configuration with the snake styles and you start to follow the arrows, okay, you might 
your two possibilities that can happen. You might end up in a tile where you have a tiling error. Okay, and that's not very interesting, but so yeah, certainly you may end up in a place where you have a tiling error. But if you never you follow the path step by step, and if you ever you if you never find a tiling error, then these tiles, snake tiles, are such that you your path is forced to be a plane filling path. It's forced to be a path that the kind of visits all the tiles on the plane, or at least it visits all the tiles of bigger and bigger squares. Okay. So either you find a tiling error on the path, or if you don't find a tiling error, you are forced to be on a plane filling path, visiting basically everywhere in the plane. I'm not showing you the construction of these snake styles, but this is just the interesting property that this one particular tile set has. And it admits a valid tiling also. So the actually the plain filling path that the snakes are forced to follow is a is so-called Hilbert curve. It's a plain filling Hilbert curve. If you start to follow the arrows, the path goes like this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then you repeat again in a bigger square, and even in a bigger square, and so on. You are covering bigger and bigger part of the of the plane if you don't find any tiling error on the path. Okay, and now we can quite easily prove that reversibility of two-dimensional cellular automaton is undecidable using snakes. So we reduce the domino problem. So you give me any tile set and I will construct a cellular automaton which is reversible if and only if you don't have a valid tiling. And this is the cellular automaton I construct for the tile set T. I kind of have three components in my states. I have a tile from the tile set that you gave me. I have a snake style. This is a my, my fixed tile set with a plain filling property. And then I have a red bit attached to each this uh, its, its state. And my local rule only changes the bit. The other two, the tiles are never changed. So the tiles remain as they are, only the bits are updated. And the local rule is the following. If, so here I'm looking at this, this is, this is the cell I'm looking at. I check the tiling property with both T and the snakes component, with both the tile components. I have the two layers of tiles. If there's no tiling error anywhere, uh, or, sorry, if there is a tiling error on any of them, any component, then my cell is inactive and I don't update the bit. So like here, for example, I have a blue color and a yellow color. So there's a tiling error. So this bit is not updated. At the presence of a tiling error, my cell is inactive. But then if I don't have a tiling error, so like here, the tiling is correct, then I do change my bit by doing a modulo 2 or XOR, exclusive OR operation, with the bit in my neighbor where I'm pointing with the arrow. So here the arrow points up. So I take one here and I XOR it to my bit. So I get zero here. So I do the XOR operation with a bit in the neighbor where my arrow points. And I claim that this is injective function if and only if the tiles of T does not admit a plain tiling. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry about the uh, increase in my speed a little bit because I'm we are running out of time. Um, so if you have a valid tiling, I have two different configurations that have the same image. Namely, you take two configurations where you have uh, correct tilings on both the snakes component and on the T component, the same correct tilings in the two configurations. In one of the configuration, all the bits are zero. In the other component con configuration, all the bits are one. And because all the cells are active, because all the tilings are correct, I do the XOR operation on all the bits. And so both configuration 
become all the bits become zero in both of them so they have the same image i have two different configurations that are mapped into the same configuration so the cellular automaton is not injective it's not reversible in other words okay on the other hand suppose that the ca is not injective and let me take two different configurations that have the same uh, image same successor and because the tiles don't change in both configurations let's call them c and d i must have exactly the same tiles on both of them because only the bits are changed and c and d are configurations that have the same image so they must have same tiles only the bits are different and they are different configurations so there is a cell let's call it p1 where they have a different bit there's a zero in one of them and one in the other one okay now because c and d are mapped to the same configuration you know that this cell has to be active otherwise this, these bits would not change so they have to change one of them has to change so it's an active cell and so the tilings are correct in this position and moreover the bit in the next position has to be different in these two configurations because one of these bits has to change the other one does not change so you have a different bit in this next position the tiling was correct in position p1 and the bit in the next position has to be different in these two configurations so now i can repeat the reasoning in this new position again the tiling has to be correct and because because the bits are changed and the bit in the next position pointed by this arrow has to be different in these two configurations let's say one in one of them zero in the other one and then i can go to the next position p4 p5 p6 and so on and in all these positions the tiling is always correct in both snakes component and the t component and because of this plain filling property of snakes this path that I'm following in this process covers the whole plane or covers bigger and bigger squares. And therefore my tiles at T can correctly tile bigger and bigger squares. So it tiles the whole plane and that finishes the reduction. So it's undecidable whether a given two dimensional CA is reversible. And in fact, with a similar, but maybe actually a bit simpler proof, we can prove that surjectivity is also undecidable. And in fact, we can prove even stronger, we can prove stronger result, which says that any property between injectivity and surjectivity is undecidable. Called recursively, we say that the reversible CA and non-surjective CA are recursively inseparable. All this is in two dimensions, actually. So I will finish with some conclusions. Uh, so I have shown, I shown you several examples of properties that we can prove to be undecidable. There's a number of other properties that you can also further properties that we can prove to be undecidable sometimes properties that are undecidable only in two dimensions but not in one dimension but sometimes undecidable already in one dimension for example reversibility and surjectivity that i very rapidly i apologize again very rapidly discussed uh, these properties are decidable in one dimension so and uh, uh, properties are, that are undecidable, for example, include injectivity on periodic configurations or surjectivity on periodic configurations or denseness of temporally periodic points and so on. These are actually all properties that are between injectivity and surjectivity, so they follow from this recursive inseparability result. These are all undecidable in two dimensions. From the nil potency problem, we also get many more results for, for one dimensional cellular automata because nil potency was undecidable for one dimension in one dimension. For example, equicontinuity, which is a dynamic, I'm not defining these concepts, but uh, just mentioning that there are many other properties. So, equicontinuity, which is a kind of uh, also uh, uh, 
trivial dynamics in some, or simple dynamics in some sense, or well, let's say uh, stable dynamics. That's undecidable. In contrast, sensitivity to initial conditions, which is a condition in chaos. That's undecidable in one dimension already. Calculation of topological entropies cannot be done by algorithm, and so on. And one annoying open question is the question about so-called expansivity, which is also a dynamical property, kind of strong form of sensitivity. We don't know whether that's undecidable or not, and it has been asked already for several, at least 20 years ago, and it's still, we don't know. So there's an, something to work further on. All right, I finish here and I thank you all for listening and I'm uh, ready to take any questions if you have something you want to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your lucid and very easy to follow ex explanations of always of tough, difficult topic, but your explanation makes it look uh, so much simpler to follow. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> So, uh, anyone is having any question? Uh, I have a, a question actually. Uh, so you were talking about uh, semi algorithm for reversible C, right? Yes. Semi algorithm for reversible C, and that what that uh, that says if the CA is uh, two dimensional CA, it is uh, uh, reversible, then you can find I you know there exists some you know inverse, then uh, mm -hmm. that is the point of logic. So, one given uh, one uh, automaton, pseudo automaton is given, maybe if you consider it is, it is reversible, then you will try with a set of uh, other CAs, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. So, uh, if we proceed in this way, then uh, any reversible uh, uh, CS, I mean, any CS given, and the question is, how can I uh, get that one? You know, the inverse. So, if uh, uh, okay. Yes. So, so it, it's really it's it's a semi algorithm. So the the algorithm semi algorithm is really st very stupid. So you just try all cellular automata one by one. You can somehow enumerate all possible local rules you go from the bigger and bigger neighborhoods try all local rules one by one and if if your oh. cellular automaton is reversible you will eventually find it but if of course it is extremely inefficient so when when we talk about the uh, uh, undecidability i don't really care about the complexity of the algorithms i'm just interested to know is there an algorithm at all even an extremely slow one so, so, so this process is very stupid. We try all cellular automata one by one until we find the inverse. Well, uh, then the point is, uh, if uh, you know, uh, number of rules, number of local rules, they're finite, right? And no, now, if no, I can, uh, number of local rules, no, they're no, finite. No, it's infinite. No, it's infinite because I, I'm not restricting the neighborhood. So I, I try bigger and bigger and bigger neighborhoods. I don't, I don't have a bound how large okay, the neighborhood yeah. is. Okay, okay, so that, okay. That's why I have an infinite number of them. Yes. If, if, okay. would, if I, you, you, you are very right. So if, if we would know a bound on the size of the neighborhood, then we would get an algorithm because then there would be just a finite number of uh, rules to try. And then we would actually have an algorithm. But the point is that we don't know an upper bound on the size of the neighborhood for the inverse rule. It can be enormous. It can be huge. Okay, uh, got it. Uh, now the uh, my uh, other question is okay. It is undecidable. Uh, I mean, uh, so therefore an arbitrary cellular automaton is given. So we can say that whether it is reversible or not. So uh, in in any special case, uh, is it possible to develop any algorithm? So for 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 special cases, I can say okay, this is this this is reversible or not. Uh, uh, well, does you the... mean some particular sub sub Yeah, 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 right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 certainly, certainly. Like for example, uh, um, uh, additive, additive CA, 
where you have a kind of algebraic yeah. structure, then we know an algorithm how to decide if it is uh, reversible or not. And I, I can imagine that there are many, many subclasses where it can be done. So this theorem just tells that for general CA, for, for yeah. the whole family of all cellular automata, you cannot make an algorithm. Yeah. But okay. surely there are interesting classes where you can design an algorithm. Okay. Uh, so uh, how big that class is? I mean, so whole class, I, I can't decide whether the arbitrary CA is reversible. But it's a subclass, uh, maybe, I mean, uh, decidable whether it's reversible or not. So how big mm -hmm. that small subclass is? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, like additive CA, but maybe maybe that's considered a small subclass. I don't know. But yeah. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good questions. Yeah. So, Kamalika, I don't hear you. Yeah, service. Uh, is it even possible to design some algorithm for uh, finding the inverse with the smallest neighborhood possible? Like the lower um, bound? Um, so, if you know the cellular automaton is reversible, mm -hmm. then potentially you can do what I just said, that you try bigger and bigger neighborhoods, and then you will find the smallest one, right? But you cannot, but if you don't know the cellular automaton is reversible, so if you're just giving a cellular automaton, then you, you, you cannot compute an upper bound on, on, on its inverse neighborhood. There's, there's no, it's one of these so-called uh, busy beaver functions that grow faster than any computable function. You cannot compute by any algorithm an upper bound on the size of the neighborhood. It's, it's rather amazing, actually, yeah. So in case of 1D, where we can decide the reversibility, in that case, there is a chance that, okay, we can develop some algorithm where, which will compute the inverse reversibles. So Absolutely. If... Absolutely. Yes. And, uh, and you can do it pretty efficiently also. There are, there are different methods. I'm, I, I, I know that uh, the Indian community has studied this uh, one-dimensional reversibility, and there's the De Bruyne uh, graph methods for for finding the inverse automaton. Also, and these are usual. These these are very efficient. Also, and we also in one dimension we also know the pretty good bound on the size of the neighborhood for the inverse function. It can be bigger, the neighborhood in the inverse direction than in the forward direction, but not not by much. And we, we, we know exactly kind of a, how much bigger it can be. Yeah. So you commented about this uh, uniform randomness in the reversible C, like yep. nothing will be, nothing useful can be found out of this. So uh, my query is, uh, if we want to uh, design, say, uh, a good random number generator, for example, then uh, should we go for this random reversible CA or should we, or should we uh, target irreversibility? Mm. So what do you think? Uh... I don't know. So, like the the random number generator that Wolfram proposed is not reversible, right? No. So, so uh, I have no. I don't know. I think you, you can do it either way. I, I suppose. Oh, I, I don't. I don't see any reason. I don't see any reason why reversible could not be used. But yeah. Okay. So, is it the property of surjectivity that is of concern? Because you said surf of surjectivity actually this. Uniform randomness system. Uh, um, that you are showing yes. Well, I, I didn't. I'm not saying that you are creating randomness because I already had the randomness in the initial configuration. So I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't like generate new randomness. Basically, I started with a random configuration. Yeah. Uh, so if you use it for random number generation, um, I don't know if it has relevance to that question. I, I'm not sure. 
and then typically for 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 creating randomness i guess you you take like a temporal sequence uh, in one cell starting from some random configuration or, uh, so yeah I, I i don't i don't really have intuition on this Sir, uh, this you are saying is it, it is an old problem. Any new development on this problem? Uh, not recently. I, I, I would be aware of. So, so we had some years ago we had some undecidability results for so-called one-sided expansiveness, which is a different variant of this question. Which seemed we, we thought that we are close, but it's turned out probably to be quite different question so it didn't lead to, to a solution thank you sir. thank you good questions uh, any more questions from the audience yes sir. yes sir. please I think model. Model. Right? Yep, yep. In the example you gave, you start from a sort of random uh, configuration, but with a bias. Yes, yes. And it ends up making less random things. I mean, it looks less random. But if you start from a uniformly random, what happens in that case? It stays uniformly random. It stands uniformly random. Yes, yes, uniformly uniform random random is, is, is preserved. preserved. Yeah, because, because the automaton is reversible, it feels a little bit counterintuitive that the in the simulation that you showed it looks like the after a few steps the configuration is less random but because it's reversible it should have the same amount of uh, same complexity. Uh, it, it, it still, still has the same, same, same amount, amount of complexity, complexity. It's just, in, in. Uh, distributed differently exactly, exactly. Okay. yeah, yeah. That's, that's a little bit surprising yeah, yeah, it, it, it does preserve, preserve the same, 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 same amount, amount of information. Yes, yes. Exactly. exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, <coughs> the simulation you have shown. Hello. Uh, the simulation yes, you have shown uh, there the ca are updated following the uh, the checkerboard pattern actually uh, the what pattern the checkerboard pattern the updation yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yes uh, yeah, so, the updating was done like that yes yeah so it's something like uh, uh, following some atomicity property the neighboring cells uh, will not update together uh, so what will happen uh, yeah, and uh, and in case of uh, Synchronous updating, it so different uh, result obviously, which is yes. not reversible. It's but not what will happen if we if we if we follow uh, some uh, other asynchronous uh, updating method like alpha synchronism with some partner vision? Uh, then, well, as soon as you if you if you guarantee that the neighbors are not updated simultaneously then you will still have reversibility clearly because the, if the neighbors uh, are not changed you know that doing the same flip again will take you back in time so reversibility but i i, I don't i have not done simulations with any any asynchronous updating but that's that's a very good question it would be maybe interesting to see how the simulation uh, looks like does it change the because uh, f for few, if we follow some alpha sync, suppose if we follow alpha synchronism updating scheme, then in case of uh, few cells, uh, the neighboring cells will update it together, and for few cells, it will not happen together uh, randomly. If if we follow random updation, then it will be go uh, uh, the dynamics follow uh, at which side uh, in case of this synchronous or in case of this checkerboard or atomicity property that will. Uh, the end. Uh, I, I, I don't know. So as, as soon as you have this possibility of updating neighboring cells, then you are losing the reversibility. So I, I think you will, you, you, you will have uh, cases. I mean, you are losing information in, in uh, but I, I don't know how the, how it would look like in the, in the long run. It would be an interesting simulation to do, but it won't be reversible anymore. Okay. And the second question is, uh, when you constructed, uh, uh, 
from tiling you ship to cello automata and uh, in the in the first uh, rule you you have shown uh, during that time so it's mm -hmm. something like that uh, we, we are following some rule and at the end of the time the fixed point is some periodic pattern so suppose is uh, uh, non periodic pattern uh, suppose yeah. uh, we are started working with uh, uh, if, if we if we started working with a finite size uh, uh, starting with a finite size two dimensional uh, pattern and uh, if we see uh, there are there are few fixed point uh, in that dynamics if we if we plot the, plot the uh, basin of attraction of this kind of dynamics is there any uh, interesting result on that if you do the, take the basin of attraction for the for the fixed points um i i again I, I i have not thought about this so i don't, I don't really i cannot uh really say anything reasonable about this <laughs> i'm sorry um okay th thank you very so, much so 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 you you you're right you're certainly attracted to to some of them maybe oh, but that... is there any partition uh in the uh configuration space uh by the these attractors uh maybe maybe yeah but if if you if you're talking about the uh the nil potency reduction then uh, as soon as you created a state q that started spreading so really there everything it's pretty much everything is attracted to this quiescent configuration and the other fixed points are actually not attracting anything right only the configuration itself because they are fixed points but as soon as you change something there, you are starting to attract towards the quiescent configuration. So that one is the only one that has a big basin of attraction, yes. right? Uh, that will be happen trivially because according to this quotient property of this quotient state. But yes. if quotient state is not there, if that's then not maybe... there, then I then I don't know what happens actually. Yeah. But, and it depends on the how probably how you do the updating because I just said that you change the tile, but I didn't specify how you change it, so that might affect it also somehow. I, I don't know. Yes, uh, there is a possibility that for different uh, updation uh, for, by following different updation of tiles, uh, for one updation it may go to one attractor, for another updation it may get go to another attractor, and uh, that will be interesting property that. Uh, starting from one, they can move to many attractors, and some cloud kind of things uh, also may happen in case of that. Mm. Yeah, that might be interesting, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, about this uh, simulation that I showed you, maybe something I didn't mention there is that there's also a conservation law there because when you when when i when when you flip this spin you know that the number of neighboring cells with opposite spins does not change because because you are changing the spin only if you had two spins up and two spins down in the neighborhood and now if you flip the spin you still have two spins up and two spins down in your neighborhood same number of neighbors with the same spin. So in other words, in that simulation that I showed, the length of the boundary, total length of the boundary between yellow and red areas does not change in time. That's that's conserved. That's preserved. Just that the, you, you get this uh, clustering, but the length of the boundary, total, if you sum up the length of the boundaries of the clusters, that's constant over time doesn't change. That's another interesting fact about this uh, Q2RCA. So it means uh, something number conservation. It's, it's like number conservation, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different conservation. It's a conservation of the number of neighbors with opposite spin. That's preserved. That's, un, that's conserved. Okay, thank you so much. Uh...
anyone else having any other question? I hope not. So, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. It was my sir. pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, we have some announcement to make. So I request you to stay back for a while. I request mm -hmm. everyone to stay back for a while. And uh, I'll over, uh, I'll invite Professor Shukanta that to do the announcement because uh, easily I am already, I'm only speaking, so maybe he, he <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, we have one announcement that we are uh, going to organize uh, a conference, uh, symposium actually, uh, first uh, Asian symposium symposium on uh, solar automata technology, 2022. So, uh, uh, so this is uh, this will uh, this will be. Uh, held on March 3 to 5 is the date and it will be an online mode because due to the situation our plan was to uh, do it in offline mode but it's not possible so uh, we have to uh, go for online mode uh, actually our plan this is an old plan so uh, in our group the people uh, in India who do research in cellular matter so from the very beginning from the 90s also the people uh, were doing so my supervisor and uh, Professor Pal Chaudhary started this research in India, uh, who uh, worked on uh, technology actually. He used the cellular automata uh, for several various applications. So anyway, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, in our group, there's a tradition of doing research in cellular automata technology. So uh, this is one way, you know. Um, uh, so uh, this time we are going to organize uh, a symposium. So this is first. Asian Symposium on Cellular Automata Technology from March 3 uh, to 5. So uh, we understand the time is short. Uh, so uh, uh, I mean, uh, so our uh, deadlines are there. So uh, we have some sub submission deadline. Uh, we have we set it in October and uh, etc. So we shall uh, let you know the dates, uh, submission date and how to submit. So uh, we'll share you uh, shortly. So I hope uh, the people who are regularly participating uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, in this webinar series, uh, we are really, really happy that regularly uh, a group of, you know, uh, uh, researchers, they are joining uh, in the discussion. Uh, we hope that uh, we'll get a contribution from them and they'll actively participate in our, in our conference and we'll be uh, have, uh, we'll have a bigger platform to exchange our ideas our research, etc. So uh, this is a brief uh, announcement. And as I've said, that we shall share the CFP very soon um, through the email. Thank you.